economy strategic priority. Uh, so we've just <laughs> noticed that the mission has been recorded. Okay. And the fourth uh, very important element is, of course, securing financial resources for these strategies to be implemented. And uh, uh, as you will see, uh, EU funding has been very uh, critical in, in that sense because uh, ESF has helped a lot regions to implement and design uh, strategies for the social economy. And once these um, strategies are adopted, if they are adopted with uh, a connection uh, to regional development priorities, then you have the mutually reinforcing dynamics that are installed and, uh, and developed. Now, the main conclusions from the four selected countries is that social economy is increasingly recognized at the national, regional, regional, and local levels, at different degrees, of course, because when you have a national law, it's widely recognized, of course, when you don't have, for instance, uh, the, the, the whole legal framework it still develops, but it could develop through an action plan, through specific measures. But in any case, uh, the trend is that social economy is increasingly recognized. Second is that when it is recognized at the national level, it definitely influences the level of support at the regional and local level, because the national level would then help support not only through legal frameworks, but also through uh, resources, through uh, supporting networks, through uh, a lot of uh, measures. The fourth element is that regions, of course, follow different approaches in involving stakeholders and social economy networks. You either have an approach through which you have a co-construction of the strategy, and sometimes, like in the case of France, for instance, it is something that is inscribed in the 2014 National Framework Law, where you have networks and regions have to meet every two years and decide on the main guidelines and the main uh, priorities to, to implement uh, for, for social economy. Funding. So EU funding has been, as I said, extremely uh, critical, uh, especially from EU, uh, from the ESF. And as you will see, some countries have taken more advantage of these funds to uh, design and implement um, uh, strategies, but others uh, have a, a long-standing tradition. So maybe they have maybe not used as much EU funds, but in any case, EU funds have been extremely critical. The last point is that, of course, um, there is a need to assess the impact of these strategies, because even if they're clearly linked to regional development, we have found that many regions do not or are not still in the stage or at the stage of um, uh, assessing the impact, uh, mainly the social impact, and also the economic impact on regional development, even if they're linked to strategic priorities in the regions. Now, I'm not going to go into all this. I'm just uh, wanted to give you an overview of what uh, regions sometimes, uh, why regions use social, in, in what strategic priorities, for instance, uh, regions uh, choose social economy. For instance, in France, uh, it, social economy is a tool to reduce disparities between, between urban and rural areas, like in the region of Corsica, for instance. In Spain, and we have today the region of Navarra, so I'm not going to go into great detail because it, uh, Bikel will do it better than, than myself. Uh, it's an engine for implementing smart speci specialization strategies and job creation strategies. In Sweden, it's more geared on uh, uh, attaining uh, SDGs and putting together the right conditions for sustainable uh, development. And in Poland, it is still more uh, focused on the integration of vulnerable groups. Funding, as you say, is, is very important. Uh, for instance, Spain and Poland, as I said, have taken really great advantage of ESF funds. Um, so I'm not... Uh, we can share the, the presentation and you can have all these details. Policy orientations. So that's my last slide. We find that for regions to take advantage of the potential of social economy, they need to, uh, first of all, 
better capitalize on the potential of the social economy. And in that, they really need to know a little bit more what these organizations are, uh, are active in, how they function, their business models, their governance models, and etc. Second, there is no need to go into having strategies where 50 and 60 measures sometimes, because uh, it's better to focus on few clear priorities and objectives, otherwise uh, stra these strategies are not fully implemented. Uh, another key policy orientation is, of course, to secure the funding and to secure also the diversification of funding, meaning from uh, national, national funds, private funds, and of course, uh, European uh, funding. Um, another very important element is to ensure that stakeholders, and in, when I say stakeholders, it's, it's the variety of stakeholders that are out there, experts, academia, networks, uh, they, they are involved in the design and uh, the implementation of the strategies right from the beginning. And of course, one of the key element is to encourage and to promote impact assessment because if we don't, if, if there aren't enough, uh, if there isn't enough evidence that these strategies are effective, then um, a lot of pe a lot of regions uh, are reluctant to uh, embrace social economy. So these are the few um, policy orientations that I wanted to share today with you, and uh, I, I hope that we can go over some of uh, some of them during the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amal, for this uh, rich and interesting presentation, which will be followed by a comment from Luigi Martinetti, the Secretary General of uh, REV, the European Network of Cities and Regions for the Social Economy, uh, with which uh, OECD has worked uh, several times in the past, including in being a member of the awards that uh, uh, Reves organized to reward the social, uh, to reward the citizen region in the field of uh, impressive uh, social, um, impressive uh, program and policies. So Luigi, the, the floor is yours for uh, five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Antonella. Thank you, everybody. I think I will uh, connect uh, with, uh, with the last slide from uh, Amal, actually. But first of all, let me just say a few words about, uh, about what is the REV. REV is the European Network of Cities and Regions for Social Economy, as Antonella was saying. That is, up to, uh, to today, the only network built around partnerships between public authority of local and regional level and social economy organization. I think it fits very well in all discussions about strategic approaches, uh, taking into consideration that actually REV was born around a strategy. Uh, we were in the middle of the 90s, and it was the first time ever that the social economy was included into a European strategy. It was the European Employment Strategy 1996, 1997, then it was approved. REV was born one year before in 1996 uh, with the idea by the uh, the, the, the initiative taken from some cities, 17 at that time cities in uh, and regions in Europe, uh, with a, a strong idea behind. Uh, funding mothers and fathers of REF uh, felt that it was important to back any kind of strategy with a clear vision, a clear vision of a society. Uh, uh, and this, I think, is a, is a very important, is even more important today we are summing crisis to crisis. The COVID crisis is the, is the last one, but we sum up with climate change crisis, et cetera, et cetera. We can face this kind of crisis only if we have a strong vision, not with a weakened vision. Uh, and strong vision is important because it provides the framework in which a strategy can be defined. Without this process, any action we take uh, risks to be just a tactical action. So an action that might not bring any change, but just keep the situation as it is. 
And when we look and when we read uh, the uh, United Nations goals, when we read uh, uh, the, the European strategy, uh, the Green Deal, for instance, etc., we see that we are putting forward a new vision, a vision for a new society. We have to keep this in mind. Otherwise, we are just building single action. I provide with three examples of what does it mean uh, been working since 25 years on the building of a common vision before building a strategy. And I will use three of our regions, knowing that there are other two members who are going to take the floor later on. Uh, and, and actions they did during the COVID, COVID crisis. And I start from Brussels Capital Region. Brussels Capital Region has a strategy for social economic development since uh, quite a long time. And it was thanks to this, to the fact that there was a strategy and a policy that they were able to react immediately by extending the support that was provided by the federal Belgian government to all SMEs, also to social economy organizations. They did in one week time, not in years, because this was in inserted into the strategy. And what is interesting is that during this crisis, there was time enough for Brussels Capital Region to review the strategy and to fix uh, a, a point about democratic enterprising going forward from social economy enterprises to democratic enterprises. Uh, the second example I would like to put forward is the one from Tuscany region. Tuscany region is in a, in a country where there is a national legal framework and is also the second region in Italy that is creating a regional legal framework supported by a clear strategy of development that uh, what is interesting is that this is done in partnership with social economy and in the introduction of this, of this new legal framework, there is a clear reference to the idea of development, of, of regional development they have. That is very similar to uh, the one from Brussels, that is a democratic development, sustainable democratic development. Uh, and the third example comes from, from Spain, from Catalonia actually. Uh, Catalonia is presently working on a strategy, but what's, what is very, very interesting is that uh, the aim or the, the, the preamble of the strategy is declaring that social economy pursue the general interest by definition. Saying this means that uh, correspond to putting all the social economy in a different playground, on a different playground, at a different stage, pursuing the general interest. And those who are not pursuing the general interest are not within the social economy, in a, if we were to put the other way uh, around. And this is very important. I, I'm coming to the end. I'm coming to the end. And uh, this is very important with what Amal said, that, the, that is lacking of evaluation. This is, at the end of the day, a way to evaluate uh, what, what is, uh, what is uh, social economy strategy. And I finish with a, with a quotation, with a quote, very relevant. Uh, when I mean, when I say, when I talk about the vision, about the vision, I refer to global vision, large vision, like for instance, pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. This is what we are pursuing. Otherwise, we are staying where we are, and we are fine where we are. Thank you. Thank you very much to you, uh, Luigi, for this very inspiring work and for reminding us of the importance of having a, a full vision of the contribution of social economy to society and economy. And this is, as you know, perfectly in line with the message that OECD portrays uh, as, as uh, put forward uh, for the last two decades. Uh, having a full understanding and a full vision of the potential of the social economy is the first step for policy maker to prepare effective and tailored uh, policy ecosystem to support social and solidarity economy. We are ready now to start our first uh, panel, uh, which, okay. sorry? <laughs> <laughs> our first uh, panel, which is on boosting reg regional uh, development through the social ecosystem and local social innovation uh, and local social innovation ecosystem. And we have three panelists, two in person and uh, another one who couldn't join us, uh, it will uh, join us uh, virtually with the video. So 
I will uh, start by introducing uh, uh, Michael Hirujo Amezaga, who is the Director General of Foreign Affairs of the region of uh, Navarra, Spain, who will present uh, a very impressive uh, smart specialization strategy in which uh, social economy has an important uh, role uh, uh, to play and uh, Michael, Michael will also underline the importance of uh, keeping uh, social economy as a driver for the recovery plans. So uh, Michael, uh, who also sits in the Committee of Region, will have to leave at some point, but if there are questions for him, his colleague uh, Beatrice Hiralga has kindly uh, accepted to reply uh, this question. So thank you very much, uh, Michael. The floor is... Uh, we cannot hear you. You will have to mute uh, your microphone. Yes, I believe I'm already on mute. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, Thank you. Thanks. No, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Antonella Amal, eh, for uh, for the invitation and for the very deep and interesting study that you have shared with uh, all of us. Uh, I see also a uh, uh, very well-known faces like uh, previous speaker Luigi and uh, I see Anders, who is uh, indeed I, I was going to mention him in this presentation. Uh, so uh, in this less than than ten minutes, uh, let me make this uh, review in. in next next uh, slide about what is the, the social economy for us is has been already mentioned as a principle by uh, amal as uh, values i think you have mentioned that uh, luigi in, in your previous presentation but uh, for us it's, it's a matter of values then secondly uh, we will introduce how and why we introduce the social economy as part of our regional strategy for growth and industry and thirdly, I mean, uh, we will focus in a European project that we have and, uh, and why, I mean, it's linked to the smart specialization. So first of all, I mean, it's, it's, it, it has been mentioned that it's about values, but not only values, it's values already recognized in the Treaty of the European Union. As you see, all the values recognized for, for uh, the social uh, economy are already recognized in the European Union. So this is the, perhaps, I mean, this is something that we should keep in mind all the time because it's not about regular economy or social economy. This is about the, the values that we already have, the respect of human dignity, democracy, equality, non-discrimination, solidarity, already values that are mentioned more than once and in the first articles of the Treaty of the European Union. So, uh, second, uh, in the second slide, because I won't stop much here because it has been already mentioned by the previous two speakers, but I really wanted to underline that we are really under the European umbrella and general umbrella. Eh? This is what we Europeans believe in uh, the economy and the society should be. So uh, in, in figures, the social economy in Navarra, you, you see very clear in the slide, is growing. And we are talking Navarra, it's a 650,000 inhabitants region. So we, we it's, it's, it's modest size. We, we never said small, but we are modest size region, uh, 650,000. One, more than 1,200 1, are social economy businesses involving more than 20,000 employees. Uh, it's around 9% of the total. And, and the turnover moved by all these companies is 2.4 billion euros. So uh, for which we need to underline the 95% of this uh, turnover come from cooperatives and labor companies. It really involves more than 28,000 associatives. And we have already all this information in the, in the website dedicated to the social economy uh, of Navarre, uh, in which you will find also the, the strategy, figures, uh, partners, and projects, and agenda, and all, all that. It's already in the slide. In, in the following slide, uh, we'll see that, uh, mm, first of all, 2014, European Union makes 
uh, mandatory for all the regions in Europe to draft uh, what is called the, the smart specialization strategy. So it is a strategy that needs to start uh, what they call in a, a, a entrepreneurial discovery process. This means that this strategy must be drafted through a very participatory way. So you need to contact the, the famous triple helix. This means this is, is government, of course, but it's uh, research and university and also industry. You need to pull them together in order to draft your plan, to, in order to draft the vision that you have for your uh, region for the following years, and also in order to underline what uh, are the priorities that you are going to have as a region in the coming years. Uh, so smart specialization on one side. And secondly, of course, uh, watching at the figures that uh, we already have shown in the previous slide, and also taking into account that during the hardest years of the, the previous economic crisis, 2011, 12, and 13, the social economy of Navarra uh, did not destroy any employment even more, even during the worst years, they created employment in Navarra and they, cre they created the business in Navarra. So uh, there was no doubt that social economy needed to be included in our smart specialization strategy. So, and, and this was made through a very common, and this is very important to underline, common and participatory dialogue with all the stakeholders of Navarra. So it has not been uh, in, uh, exclusively a government decision, okay? It has been done through a participatory, uh, participatory uh, uh, planning. So what we did was to include social economy as part of our key elements of uh, regional growth. And then we drafted a plan, a plan which in the previous website, it's, uh, it's a plan from 7020. So we are now renewing the, the plan for 21-24. Uh, at this moment, but uh, in, in general, I mean, it, it's really, uh, as you see, uh, includes uh, the parts of what is the social economy, uh, quality of employment, social innovation, business development, this is very important, and uh, this participatory governance. The next uh, slide, please. We'll, we'll see that, uh, so we have uh, the importance of the uh, social economy Navarra, the importance of the smart specialization as a European Union policy. So we join both of them. We include social economy in our, uh, uh, in our smart specialization. And then I mean, we decided together with other regions to lead uh, a European partnership based in smart specialization. Because so smart specialization is not only about individual regions doing individual uh, strategies for themselves to the future. Smart specialization is just the first step uh, according to the plans of the European Commission to, that we share in order regions to cooperate among them based on their strategies. So let's see if we have already uh, put a, a social economy of our, uh, a strong part of, uh, of our uh, uh, vision then we will share this, we will try to share it with other regions in Europe that uh, have um, similar visions. Okay. So we created this uh, European level partnership on social economy uh, with, I mean, uh, with the aim of to improve competitiveness and to create European value chains for, uh, for uh, uh, social economy. And of course, to foster social economy clusters uh, and try to work through an interregional inter uh, way among them. Next slide, please. Uh, the project that we have in mind, and uh, Anders uh, will, will speak uh, uh, afterwards. I mean, he's already involved. Uh, Orebro is, is, is one of the leading regions as well, is to create a, a pan European business school of social economy. Because uh, what uh, I mean, what we have noticed is that, of course, social economy meaning is it's quite diverse, uh, depending on the region. The vision of the social economy itself is is quite uh, different. And if we if we have the vision of uh, of to foster the the social economy, we need to create like a pan European business school. I mean, how to to train people in order them to to be able to know that uh, you can create business also through a, uh, yeah, next, next slide, please. Through a, 
through social economy values. I will skip this, uh, this slide. This is what the smart specialization is with the triple helix, but uh, I think in order to try to gain some, some time, I will skip that. What I wanted to underline mainly, and this is my, my last, last slide with two, 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 two points. I mean, first of all, Navarra. Uh, social economy is, is, is important because we have seen the figures, but we need to know that 95% of this turnover, for instance, comes from cooperatives and labor enterprises. We are talking about industry. It's industry. So we have big cooperatives, um, mainly from, uh, but not only, eh, coming from what perhaps you already know, Mondragon Group, but it's not exclusive for that. We have other big factories some of them with more than 1,000 employees that uh, are competing in the market, in the automotive markets, in the renewable markets, in the agri-food industry market. So they are, uh, they are full industrial um, uh, companies that are competing in the free market, taking and holding the social economy values because this is possible. Secondly, very important, territory. What we have seen, especially during the crisis, uh, is that uh, many of the typical view of, of the regional industry is that we have some companies that become important. They become bigger, regular companies, I mean. And once they, uh, they have a size that is already relevant, perhaps 500 employees or the uh, in many, in often what happens is that a big multinational comes and it bought it. Uh, so uh, we, lose this uh, local attachment to the territory. So something that won't happen with the social economy industry, they will remain being linked to the territory. So taking into account these two aspects, the values, uh, so the importance, uh, what we see is that in order to fight uh, what to, to, or to, to, to take front of all the, the challenges that we have uh, to the, in front of COVID-19, the smart specialization may be the clue because we live in, an, in a Europe that is full of different strategies. Uh, we live in a world that is full of strategies. We have the sustainable uh, development goals, but in the European Union, we have the European research area goals, the, the commission priorities, including the Green Deal, skills agenda, digital. Uh, we also have what the coming horizon Europe, its own strategy full of missions. We have the new recovery plan, and we have uh, EU a budget of uh, cohesion fund. So a smart specialization is the perfect link in order to channel us all these strategies and prepare your companies, of course, including the social economy ones, to, uh, to face all the challenges of COVID-19. So thanks a lot. Um, perhaps it was too much for this uh, less than 10 minutes, but uh, open for questions. Many thanks. It was excellent. Thank you very much. You were perfect on time. And uh, it is evident how this very impressive uh, strategy is indeed uh, the result of a clear understanding of the role of social economy, including in the industrial sector. And it uh, is inspired by a, a overarching vision. Thank you very much. I'm sure it can inspire uh, many other uh, regions. So now I will uh, pass the floor to Sarah Prince uh, Robin, who is the, uh, can, can you mute your microphone, Mikkel? <laughs> Perfect, no problem. <laughs> uh, so I was passing the floor then to uh, Sarah Robin, uh, Sarah Hans Robin, who is the diplomatic advisor of the High Commissioner for Social and Solidarity, Economy and Social Innovation. And we are very happy to have you here, uh, Sarah. Uh, Mr. Etier is uh, our uh, delegate to the lead directing committee and we are very pleased also and we thank you for the support that you have given to us during the preparation of this uh, note. So 
also uh, Sarah has mentioned by Amal before, France has done a lot also to support the social and solidarity economic economy during uh, the crisis as, at national level. But we would like to hear now what can be done at the regional level uh, to further support uh, this. Thank you very much, Sarah. The floor is yeah. yours. Thank you very much, uh, Antonella, Amal, and, and everyone for the invitation and for the work uh, that you've done on the publication that is uh, really interesting. So I'll focus uh, first shortly on what we've done at the national level, which is linked with uh, some regional issues. And I will take some examples of what could be done uh, you know, at the regional or subnational level. Uh, so of course, in France, the COVID-19 crisis strongly affected the French um, enterprises in the social and solidarity economy sector. Uh, it affected them in two ways. Uh, of course, um, the first one for those whose activity was strongly or even completely stopped, and the second one for the ones whose activity were directly at the front or the second line of the crisis. So regarding the first ones, uh, we do not yet have official statistics at the national level. Studies are underway by type of organization of the social economy. So as Amal said, we are quite organized in France with our logo legal framework. Uh, we have five families for social economy, association, mutuals, cooperatives, foundation, and social entrepreneurs. Um, a first study was carried out by the Mouvement Associatif, so our associations. It reveals that more than two-thirds um, of the association operated at less than 20% of the normal activities during the period of lockdown. So the most affected by this children are the small cultural and sport association, or even popular education. Uh, so two-thirds of the associations still use partial unemployment and 40% of them even want to maintain partial unemployment for as long as possible. And regarding the second ones, we could see how essential the social economy was during the crisis. And um, as uh, Luigi said, we need to really uh, focus on a new way of seeing the things and a new system. Uh, so whether in health, medical, social, food, agriculture, uh, we really saw that social and solidarity enterprise have greatly contributed to the national effort. So in response to the crisis, the French government has implemented immediate support measures. So at the national level, it could be reports of deadlines for social impact, um, direct tax rebates, the deferral of rents and bill payments. Uh, we had a specific help uh, net of 1,500 euros for small businesses, and, you know, the guarantee of bank cash lines, rescheduled bank credit, reinforced partial unemployment, as I said, and the help of a business ombudsman. Um, so also what we did for social economy is that we pushed for a circular that was uh, publicated by the prime minister uh, that said that the state should support them, uh, especially with the grants, and urge other public authorities like regions, departments, and cities to do the same. But we do not have the power to force them to guarantee the grants. Um, regarding social economy enterprises, specifically the high commissioner uh, quickly set a liaison unit with the main network heads. Uh, this liaison unit made um, and is continually continuing to do so every week. Um, it also brought together partners with representatives from Caisse des Dépôts as well as France Active, BPI France. So each week we allowed to her the networks to know the points of attention, the experiencing difficulties of access to the aid. And we had many ministers coming, like the health minister, for example, or the uh, state secretary for economy. Uh, we also invited representatives of associations of local elected representatives. We had the one from regions and the one from the city. Uh, we also prepared a document listing all the measures by the government that could be of interest for social enterprise. But we also had the link for the different plans that were made by the different regions in the document. Um, we also implemented a specific measure in order to fill a missing point that we found out in the traditional support measures. It was called the SSE Relief Facility. It's to offer simple, rapid, and flexible emergency aid, so has to be close as possible to the needs and the diversity of situation of enterprises, association of less than three employees. Concretely, the relief facility consists of direct aid in the amount of 5,000 euros, accompanied by an offer of support. Um, so this facility is really managed at a local level, not national ones, even though we decided about it. The High Commissioner thinks that the ones that knows better, you know, the actors on the grounds are the contacts directly in the territories. So therefore, our facility 
has been created under the already existing program, Dispositif Local d'Accompagnement, that you can find about on the OECD report and in cooperation with France Active uh, with the support of public and private funds. Um, we also have been in contact with our regional chambers uh, for social and solidarity economy to have direct feedback on the issues uh, that social and solidarity economy organizations could meet. Uh, we support the observatory on the social economy that collects data and produces key figures and publication on the contribution of the social economy to employment, well-being. Um, its work is very, it will be very important in the future to follow the impact of the crisis. And so in order to supplement government aid, the French regions, um, they have adopted specific plans with the help of the Banque des Territoires, so our territories bank. Usually the region and the bank have created a specific social and solidarity fund of several millions in total uh, to support the structure of SSE. Uh, its vocation is to provide a panel of several financial solutions in the form of short and middle term loans with deferred reimbursements and in order to meet the need of structures whose activity is impacted by the health crisis and now the economic and social crisis. So these tools uh, are providing advice, uh, support and financing for beneficiaries and it should enable enterprises to consolidate their financial situation by ensuring that financial assistance from the bank is maintained and also support uh, you know, to restart the, their activity. I can share with you the example of the Provence Alpes Côte d'Azur region it's in uh, south of France, but most of the French region adopted the same kind of plan. So they adopted their Marshall Regional Emergency Solidarity and Recovery Plan with 1.4 billion euros and a regional solidarity plan in favor specifically of the associative and cultural sector. Uh, the region has decided to participate in our national solidarity plan by, uh, launched by the state for 18 million. So the overall contribution of Région de France, so the whole entire association of the, the different regions, is 250 million euros out of a total of 1 billion. The plan is renewable from April and it will depend on the evolution of the situation. And it's separated into two parts. The first part is the help of 1,500 euros for very small businesses and 2,000 euros for bigger businesses. And 5 million euros have been secured and paid for the sport sector despite the cancellations, uh, the voted granted uh, will be maintained, which is one of the things that I was talking about. So for the cultural sector, for example, in the South region of France, there's an envelope of 35 million euros. Some local authorities also put some plans on the tables, uh, you know, in, in coordination with us. So I can take the example of the city and metropolis of Strasbourg. Uh, they made several actions, like they shared all information um, there could be local or national information like legal facts, help desks, webinars, surveys, and study results every day to more than 60 contacts that they have on the social and solidarity sector. They made analysis of situations via contact with business managers and report problems encountered to states uh, like us, <laughs> our liaison unit, and regional services, and they were looking for a solution. They participated. Uh, at the city and metropolis in the financial fund for business support. Um, so one million that went directly to a regional fund. And they had reflection about the solution space with the structure, with a view to emerging from the crisis. So they formalized data and a document recommendation, which all of them at the end of the lockdown to quickly finance initial very concrete solutions up to 100,000 euros. So they supported activities and employment cooperative, for example, for isolated entrepreneurs, they supported Emmaus, that you probably know about, um, that were helping the homeless and um, people out of prison during the crisis. And they support uh, also the regional chamber of social and solidarity economy to relay those economic measures. Um, they had also the discussions on relocation of industries for in the future. That's a big uh, issue at the moment in France, to have our industries localized in France and not abroad. And then we had uh, adaptation of alignment of the economic measures taken by the Euro metropol metropolis in terms of economy that were not uh, fully, uh, you know, well done for social economy actors. Um, so finally, about the recovery plan, uh, our region will add up recovery plan. And of course, we are expecting to have their own regional strategy for social and solidarity um, strategy to be adapted um, at, the, at the national level, 
um, we ask our different social and solidarity actors to make some recommendations. So we finally had a document a few weeks ago, so we are going to work on that. And we are having uh, discussions to have finally the recovery plan uh, in the fall. And so the French government also had a lot of expectation, uh, like the former president said, uh, about the different European recovery plans and of course the European Social Economy Action Plan that will be done for 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, Sarah, for this very exhaustive uh, presentation. Uh, we can now show the video by Anders Bro, who apologizes and greets everyone here. He is the development manager of the region Orebro County in Sweden. And you will see in this message, you will also underline the importance of taking in account the local tradition, the local... Uh, sorry for the technical issues. Here we are. Sorry, we are aware you can't hear very well. We are trying to fix this. Uh, we, we, we take a couple of minutes to see whether we can fix it, otherwise we will skip it. Uh, we are sorry. Uh, so, sorry, we have to skip this, but we will send to you all the link of this uh, very interesting question, uh, presentation. In the, if there are questions, you will send uh, the question to us. So, we can now start uh, uh, the question and answer session. So, you will not have the possibility to uh, use your video. Therefore, it is essential that you raise your hand on the chat and you will be given the floor. Your microphone will be muted. Uh, there are people who have already asked some question in the chat. So please feel free to raise your hand and put uh, directly this question to the panelists. Uh, just to uh, maybe have one of our panelists uh, responding to one of the questions that were asked by in the chat box. Um, there was this question about how to maintain the structure, the staff and the resources of the social economy during the pandemic. So uh, maybe if we have uh, either Mikel or Sarah or even Luigi on this question. Thank you. I can if you want, Emma. 
um, this is exactly what our um, facility was, even though it's only for, for the social and solidarity and um, organization that are less than three employees, but we have other facilities. Um, what we really wanted, it was to maintain jobs. Uh, so what we've done is really to have this direct grant. So it's not, the, you know, they won't have to reimburse us um, just, you know, for the time to have their activity back. So it's a direct grant of 5,000 euros. So it's one, one job for one month or two months, depending on the salaries. And, and this is really what we were all working about, uh, on at the moment. And, um, you know, more than um, the different um, things that we've done, we are really working with the private sector. Um, so our funds is really made of public and private funds. So we're working on that. Um, because of course, for all the territories, it's not only one social economy organization, it will have an impact on the whole ecosystem at the local level. So we really have those, um, you know, more uh, traditional enterprises that we're really uh, helping. And so we also have um, those local authorities um, uh, that are willing, for example, Toulouse Metropole is uh, working at the moment with us also to have a, a participation in the fund and we will then direct in the specific needs of the territories because we've made it national you know facility but what is really needed for social and solidarity economy is specific measures so this is what we are working and the high commissioner has an interministerial um, position in the government so this is why we are directly in contact with for example the culture uh, sports economic ministries and to have those specific measures. And then we have all the sub-national authorities that are, we are encouraging to have specific measures for social and solidarity and, um, enterprises, because of course we can have all the global measures for those type of organization. Um, so this is what we are working on in France. Um, I'm not saying that we are uh, you know, managing everything, but I think this is the main message. Uh, you have to have specific measures for, for SAP. Thank you. Yes, Luigi, please go ahead. And there is also something you might be want to comment because I see in the chat uh, someone saying that uh, the establishment of partnership uh, at regional and local level for the social economy is sometimes the hardest part of the story. So you might also want to address this. Thank you very much. Yes, actually, this second uh, question was probably to be addressed by the intervention we couldn't hear from Anders Bru in Orebro, because uh, actually it's, it is true that this is, this is challenging and uh, it is important that regional authorities, as the Orebro did, understand that this requires some resources. It's not something that comes pop out of nothing. It's not that you can just call uh, organizations without having an idea of how to build a partnership and, uh, and, and, and they, they will come and, and work together. What was interesting in Orebro was that they, they decided to take their time, was approximately, if I remember correctly, was 12 months. They decided to contact, get in touch with everybody, literally. There are 181 or something like this organizations in the Orebro County, and they all participated, directly or indirectly, in meetings, in contacts, in whatever, but they've been participating. And this is interesting because the result of this is that Anders is just editing right now a guide for partnership in Sweden. So on how to develop a partnership. I think we should have more than this. Uh, more the, the, I mean, more of this kind of, a, of, of experiences, also because they are very much uh, context uh, sensitive, which means that it's not the same to build a partnership in, in Sweden or in Spain or in France. So we should really, even though in France, for instance, there are great, great examples from Strasbourg and other areas, uh, uh, but we should have some kind of guidance of a general level, of a global level, and I, I know that uh, OECD has been doing <laughs> things uh, of this kind. Uh, but then we should also learn how to uh, adapt and, and use them on the local level in the, in, the, in the relevant context. I come back to the previous question that was the one about the support during the crisis, crisis period. As I was saying uh, before talking about Brussels capital, in that case, for instance, we had a situation where the regional authority decided to complement a federal action. That is the other way around uh, uh, the, the, what was happening in France, because in, in Belgium there was not a, a federal, a national uh, program as, as in France. 
So the, the, the capital region uh, did something very similar by providing the support of 4,000 euros per uh, employee per any kind of, of social economy organization, including small associations having employees. Uh, that was very, very important. Uh, but I would like also to mention another point on which I, I invite you to, to think. In the, probably in the worst period of the COVID crisis that was uh, middle of March, uh, we, as, as REV, we issued an Eastern survey to try to understand what was the real need of social economy organizations. Most of the reactions came from Spain, because in that moment, Spain was really in the, in the hotspot of the crisis. And it was interesting, the fact that half the respondent, and there were 120, something like this, the, the survey lasted two days, three days, uh, half of them were not worried about how to deal during the crisis, but how to deal after the crisis. The big worries, worry was, uh, are we going to still have a market? Because we have to keep in mind that most of social economic organizations act, as uh, Mikkel was saying, in the market. And very often they provide services to persons which are not paid by uh, regional or public authorities, but by the persons themselves. These are care uh, providers. And one of the big pro problems they have, especially for those providing care to households or persons, is that nowadays these persons, these persons might have problems in uh, buying the products. So we shall have a, a, a strategy just because we also need to understand at which level and when we shall intervene. Might be supporting directly, but might be also by supporting the, uh, the market of social economy enterprises. In much, we are uh, moving to the second uh, panel, which will focus uh, on social economy in regions and cities. We have a number of uh, speakers and we are running late, so we, are, we really count on uh, you to stick to the time. I am going to introduce Anna Umbelino, who is the Vice Major of Torre Vedras in Portugal that will present the strategy adopted by the city and this is a very impressive strategy again because it really looks to us as a, a local ecosystem built around social economy and, and social innovation. Mm -hmm. So Anna, thanks for joining us. The floor is yours for 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Also, um, I would like to, to ask if it is possible to uh, show the, the, the slides. Okay. Thank you very much again. So it is uh, for me a, a great pleasure to participate in this uh, live forum that gravitates around a set of uh, quite interesting uh, uh, questions. In times of uncertainty and negative macroeconomic uh, projections, such as the ones we are experiencing now, with an expected GDP significant contraction, social um, uh, fragmentation risk, autocratic attempts, how can social economy be in this harsh contest an agent of territorial resilience and transformation towards the desired just ecological and social transition, leveraging the local community potential? And what is the role of local authorities in that process? What kind of transformations can effectively public policies induce at local ecosystems that may actually contribute to achieve local, national, European, global development goals? And how is that progress measured? By which metrics embedded in which frameworks? Thus, a major question arises, how can we unleash the potential of a medium-sized city, territory, um, like uh, uh, Torres Vedras, which is not uh, exceptional. It's, it's a common territory uh, that we find um, all over uh, Europe, because we think that we shall also look 
to common people, to common territories, um, and not just to the exceptions. So we are uh, obviously um, embedded in a specific national and regional context and influenced by its multiple determinants. Um, and in order to give a brief overview of Portuguese national landscape concerning social economy, I would like to highlight two relevant milestones. The first one concerns with the satellite accounts on social economy, uh, launched for the first time in 2010, updated every three years. The satellite account embodies a structured, simplified and coherent representation of um, uh, social economy activity, allowing uh, comparisons. Another significant event refers to national framework law on social economy and indisputable contribution to explicit institutional and legal recognition of uh, social economy sector in, in Portugal. It comprises guiding principles and the mechanisms for uh, SE promotion and encouragement and describes the creation of a tax and competition regime which takes into account the sector idiosyncrasies. Uh, Subscribing the underlying vision of society and economy, acknowledging its added value, uh, Torres Vedras is a territory committed with social economy. Therefore, considering the importance of data to enhance territorial intelligence and creativity, we recently conceived the Atlas of Social Economy and opened a center of studies that intends to build knowledge about the territory and so to inform public policies and assess progress and uh, impact. Here we find a snapshot of the results that depicts our local reality. We start by the ecosystem composition. We follow with the most frequent type of services that express the higher weight of uh, health and social services. So care, uh, uh, care uh, services comparing to uh, national data. We find interesting trends that um, show social economy externalities in the job creation of women and vulnerable uh, groups. The sector uh, committed uh, to solve community real problems and the relevance of social economy to local markets, and I would like to stress that dimension, uh, it's, it's crucial um, because it uh, uh, is performed not only in economical terms, uh, but it also has an ecological impact, taking into account the shorter um, circuits of products and goods acquisitions that represent a decrease in the carbon footprints. And lastly, a broad and ambitious agenda pointed by the sector players that requires coordination, action and effective answers. So um, we are discoordinated in, in what concerns to the slides, but then I will, I will send the, the presentation. So let's pick some concrete examples in where City Council has been intervening. The first one relies on an innovative territorialized ecosystem that crosses public authorities, namely the City Council, 12 districts or parish, and 13 um, social economy organizations, uh, several SMEs, namely local producers, and cuts across different sectors. It is an alternative to mainstream food school supply system purchased by multinational traditional capitalistic companies that used to run the municipality's public tenders thanks to a low price policy. So performing a gesture of resistance and of public investment, we built an alternative um, model. It actually embodies a, a grassroots cluster, as I mentioned before, that relies on four 
essential pillars. So I would uh, like to ask uh, to the slides to go in the opposite direction, please. So the, the, first, um, the first one, it's uh, production. So the program promotes direct contact with um, the cultivation uh, process of, of vegetables in accordance with the organic farming techniques um, through school gardens managed by the Municipal Environmental Educational Center. It um, currently reaches approximately uh, 1,200 students enrolled at uh, preschool and as well as in primary school. And uh, I would like to highlight that during this pandemic crisis, the students have been delivering emergency vegetables baskets to local philanthropic organizations. Then the second pillar refers to acquisition through public procurement. And in order to purchase goods and services from local producers and suppliers, we design a set of specific criteria, such as the freshness of the, of the products, measured in the time spent in transportation, in order to reach environmental goals. So we had to be uh, uh, creative in, in the uh, design and operationalization of the criteria uh, with very very specific and objective metrics in order to fulfill the law, uh, the legal requirements. Um, the preparation and uh, deliverance of, uh, of school meals is assured by the 13 social economy organizations that are spread through the territory. They all take advantage of previous installed capacity concerning the equipments and infrastructures that they already had because they also supply um, foods, uh, namely to uh, elderly, uh, providing uh, um, uh, direct uh, assistance services. And so this was uh, a way of maximizing endogenous resources and making them um, earn uh, to have... Anna, Anna, sorry to interrupt you, just to warn you that you have uh, just a couple of minutes uh, before okay. ending. We cannot okay. handle the, um, the slide. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, no problem. So uh, I would like to say that obviously in complements we have uh, um, uh, educational programs that uh, try to change uh, um, behaviors taking into account this system of, of values in where we um, uh, give much importance to uh, healthy food habits, food waste management, and uh, sustain sustainable behavior change. So this multi-level, multi-stakeholder network embodies in itself an attempt to create an innovative model of food governance, which generates economic dynamics anchored locally. It has several different impacts. I um, will just highlight the environmental and, and social ones. Um, namely in what concerns to job uh, creation. Um, uh, we, uh, we contribute to create job um, employing cities, citizens from small village, villages, mostly rural ones that face the population and among them citizens in a vulnerable condition. So in, in a sense, we are also contributing to create um, territorial cohesion and create opportunities in uh, deprived uh, uh, rural areas in our, in our county. Obviously that the system also contributes for social economy financial sustainability without creating dependency relations based on public assistance. And um, I would like to underline also that during the lockdown, the, we kept the contracts with, uh, with these organizations in order to guarantee the reimbursement of fixed costs and employment maintenance um, uh, of, of uh, the, uh, uh, these organizations. Um, 
I would I would like to say that uh, we are now ongoing a decentralized process in in Portugal, and so our scope is to progressively scale up this this program to all uh, school levels in order to reach um, the full universe of of students and obviously to get more social economy organizations uh, abroad. Uh, unfortunately, I will not be able to um, give other examples. Uh, the other example that I would like to, to mention and which answer one of the needs that was mapped in the survey that we did um, at, at the sector was concerned with uh, social Im impact management and assessments. We also create a program, an ongoing program that uh, aims to um, uh, uh, increase capacity building for uh, strengthening the social economy uh, ecosystem and uh, um, to uh, prove that actually these organizations create richness. And how can we measure the richness that uh, has has been created in our territory? But thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Anna. We are really sorry to have to cut you because this is a very important uh, element measuring the impact that the OECD look. So carefully after but I'm sure we will share the PowerPoint and I'm sure we will have many questions for for you so I'll give now the the floor to Karel van der Porten uh, who is a policy officer for the from the European Commission the director general from the internal market who will present us uh, some of the measures uh, taken by the European uh, uh, Union. Thank you very much, uh, Karel, and sorry to put pressure on you, but we really would appreciate if you can uh, stick into the time. Thank you very much. Uh, don't worry, Antonella, can you hear me? Okay, perfect, and you can see my slides as well? Okay, but I cannot hear you. That's very strange. Ah, you're muted. Sorry, yeah, okay. I'm muted. So we can hear you, <laughs> okay, we can see perfect. the slide, we don't see you. Uh, uh, I will enable my, my video. First. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Antonella, and also dear uh, other colleagues. Um, I'm very happy to see so many familiar faces with, with uh, uh, experiences with, where we have uh, worked together already a very long time. Um, on so I think that what I will present and what I will bring will be um, just in line with the previous speakers um, but first um, we need to go a bit in into the disruption and and how social economy uh, experienced um, or suffered or made also a good case out of the COVID-19 um, within DJ Grow we have uh, done uh, quite some some research and and surveys on the disruption on on many uh, industrial ecosystems as we say um, and we did this also for the social economy um, along these lines we um, organized several uh, let's say online seminars to uh, show how social economy quickly responded to the COVID-19 crisis um, what different types of actions were taken from voluntary actions to digital um, actions, uh, setting up platforms, uh, providing uh, tools, but also very local, uh, small initiatives, and so on. So um, if we look into the health bulletin of, of the social economy, and this is, of course, a very rough uh, approach, um, we see several uh, trends and several um, uh, aspect. So first of all, um, we have seen uh, that there was, just like in many other sectors, uh, a huge drop in, in revenues, for, uh, especially uh, when the crisis uh, immediately hits our continent, uh, with temporary cessation of, of numerous activities, um, certainly those who had direct physical uh, contact. Um, so that means that many are at risk of, of complete closure due to um, a very limited uh, stock of reserves. Of course, we cannot extrapolate or, or generalize this for the whole social economy. Some are very robust and have really st a long stretch of, 
uh, reserves, but others are working with very limited uh, financial resource, for example, if you're engaged in public procurement activities, if you work as a service provider, and this is one of the most crucial um, problems because you, uh, many social enterprises could not fulfill anymore their obligations within a procurement relation and therefore um, have, are facing to uh, very soon to, to have uh, less uh, income streams. Um, however, the social finance sector um, is since the last crisis uh, quite well developed and that is not only in general but especially for the social economy uh, sector we have organized a very specific webinar on this uh, with very, uh, with uh, similar social banks and members of, of uh, febea and there it was very clear that the instruments developed in the in the previous economic crisis were very helpful now to overcome certain first eight issues of, of social enterprises in terms of, of a quick liquidity uh, issue. So that is a very interesting and, and, and positive trend. Um, we have also seen that there is a huge mobilization of, of um, personal investment in terms of, of uh, volunteers, but also crowdfunding initiatives, philanthropy, uh, donations at a very local scale. So people really wanted to help each other uh, at the local scale. And the social economy was really like the, um, the hub that channeled all these aid towards the need and uh, also way beyond the social economy ecosystem and beyond the social economy uh, community, let's say. So that was very, very interesting to see all these very small phenomena. Um, what was very pressing, and I think that Luigi also uh, highlighted this and, and, and it's really worrying, is that many um, support measures were not accessible for social enterprises or social economy organizations, for example, ter temporary unemployment, liquidity aid, and so on. This was not a fact for every country, and we have also seen very positive uh, elements in, in countries where this was really open towards the social economy sector, but in others, there was no uh, option to, to to have this type of aid. Um, if we look at, at several types, and I highlighted uh, just three of them, there are of course way more uh, types of social economy. The first are the social services, which suffered a lot. Um, as I said, because this higher demand of care and aid, so the some some reports we, we have seen, there was a, a triple, uh, a tripling demand of, of social aid, but the people who should deliver this were not able to carry this uh, anymore. Um, so that was that was a, a huge stress that would, was put on very local social services, for example, services towards homeless people and so on. Um, also a lack of personal protection just because this is a very personal and physical uh, type of work. Um, the second one is work integration social enterprises, which has very similar approaches, but they are more like industrial partners. Um, so they have, um, they are hit twice, basically. They are hit in the sense of a social of a social service, but they are also hit in the, in the sense of a, of a very regular industrial uh, company. Um, and then we have also seen that that is more a general, uh, um, uh, let's say, a general conclusion that just like in any other sector, for example, tourism, uh, social enterprise are also active. So there is actually no difference in these type of very, very specific uh, nays uh, sectors, let's say, how social enterprises have suffered. But we have also seen some positive elements, and that is definitely worth um, to, to highlight the first uh, positive one is really the agriculture sector. We have seen like a revalue or an, let's say uh, a reacceptance of very short uh, chain uh, local organic ecologic uh, farming products. People really wanted to buy local, wanted to buy social local um, and, and, and they are revalued in the hearts of the consumers. Now we really have to hope that this sustains also that people didn't do it just because of the crisis but also that they really have better acceptance and, and appreciation for these type of, of products. Um, the second one, and that is where we where we have organized quite some workshops uh, on, is, is the digital social services and the platforms, also the activity of the commons. Very interesting was uh, to see how suddenly this whole digital commons world, um, I'm sorry, uh, this whole digital commons world was developing new solutions, not only for within social enterprises, really for the local communities, but also to, to cooperate with traditional SMEs to develop 
a very very quick uh, response uh, aid protection material but also even uh, ventilators and so on so that was very very beautiful to see how suddenly the the, the traditional sme world uh, came very close with with the digital social economy partners what what we call uh, the digital commons world um, and then a last remark i want to highlight and which is really important and that shows also a bit some um, let's say uh, weaknesses of our system that social economy suddenly had to jump into uh, disrupted ecosystems so disrupted value chains where certain products were not delivered anymore or where, where we were not able anymore to produce them many social enterprises jumped into this market gap if i can say and that is of course uh, very good but also it shows that we have also much of weaknesses where we depend on on, on huge a uh, span in, 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 in travel, let's say, uh, for certain products and where we have no sufficient delivery anymore in crisis time. Um, as I said, and that is where we, ver where we are very happy on, our commissioner has identified and, and DJ Grow has identified several 14 ecosystems uh, for recovery and where we are very happy that social economy is recognized as one of the uh, 14 important uh, ecosystems for, for recovery. So this was also thanks to the, the, the mapping that we have done of disruptions, thanks to the many figures we have selected and collected from, uh, from the, the social economy sector that we can prove that it is really like a word uh, it's worth mentioning this the, this um, this sector. It's not a sector. This ecosystem, really, in the view of an, a real ecosystem, and not only in a sectoral uh, approach. Very briefly, I, I want to highlight that uh, the Commission is, of course, taking action for the general recovery, and where, thanks to these ecosystems, we want to give social economy a very prominent place uh, in, and that is, first of all, the next generation EU, of course, which was launched uh, in May, and the re reinforced long-term uh, budget, which was also proposed um, in May. Just to give you a very brief overview of the three pillars, I guess many people know, but one of the most important is, of course, the recovery and resilience facility, which exists out of grants and loans. But there is very clear grant component as well, because we believe that many of the disruptions that were visible and read will need also to be revalued and need a sufficient amount of grants and not only a loan. It's not only a loan that you need to restart your business, but also to uh, substantiate a bit more um, the quality of certain services and products that are definitely uh, developed within the social economy. So we hope that that this grant component will be very uh, important uh, for them. So I think um, I can close with one more slide, if I may, or am I over time? <laughs> okay. Uh, am I still chairing or not? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes, okay, one okay. Um, I will keep it very brief because I have seen that 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 Anna and that uh, Mikael and and other uh, Anders Bro normally also would highlight really the importance of local social economy ecosystems where you bring industrial partners, where you bring civil society, where you bring research and and uh, public authorities together in what we call an industrial uh, cluster. But we have seen that many of these industrial clusters also exist within the social economy with this really social impact goal and not only this competitiveness uh, approach. It's a small slide that summarizes, but I, I'm over time, so I, I will share after while, afterwards more information. So thank you very much and have a, a wonderful session. Thank you to you, Karel. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, it is now time to go to Poland and to introduce Jakob uh, Szymanek, uh, who from the Ministry of Investment and Economic Development, working in the department of uh, ESF, uh, which has a, had a very important role in uh, helping uh, social economy to, to shape up. Uh, Thank you for accepting our invitation, Jakub, and uh, the floor is yours for 10 minutes, if you can. Thank of you course. very much. Thank you very much, and I hope I'm, uh, you hear me clearly. Uh, okay. Um, so, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the OECD team for organizing this such interesting webinar and inviting me. Uh, uh, like uh, like Antonella said, I'm working in the Ministry of Development Funds and Regional Policy. Uh, we are uh, the ESF Managing Authority in Poland. First of all, I would like to uh, briefly overview the social economy sector in Poland. Uh, currently in Poland operates around 93,000 social economy entities. 
This group consists of many legal firms, associations, foundations, cooperatives, supported employment enterprises, reintegrational units. The core of social economy in Poland consists of social enterprises. They are not separate legal forms, but a status that can be obtained by social economy entity. Uh, the basic criteria uh, are performing economic activity, employment of 30% uh, of people from groups at risk of social exclusion, <coughs> excuse me, democratic governance, no profit distributions. There are currently little over 1,200 social enterprises in Poland. ESF supports social economy since the start of this fund in Poland. With current financial perspective with the biggest allocation, 7 to 72 million euros in the national program and over 267 euros, uh, million euros in 16 regional operational programs. From national level, systematic changes or action are supported. For example, monitoring system, accreditation of centers, social economy support centers. Uh, national program also supports development of new ideas, such as an, an, an introduction of social franchising in Poland. In 16 regional operational programs, most funds are allocated to direct support for social economy entities, with primary goal being workplace creation in social enterprises. Up to date, almost 9,000 workplaces has been created in this financial perspective alone. Mm. Support system based on ESF funds is pretty unique. On the national level, Ministry of Labor, Family, Labor and Social Policy is responsible for policies regarding social economy. On the level of 16 uh, regions, uh, regional centers for social policy are responsible for managing all the actions. Direct support is provided by social economy support centers. Approximately 60 of, of them are now in operation on the sub-regional level. So uh, in one region, we have from two to six centers, depending of population or regional needs. Mm. Uh, and those centers are created by non-governmental organizations or, the, or partnerships with other entities from other sectors. Uh, they offer a wide variety of services, counseling, training for new and established, established social economy entities. They also distribute most of direct financial support. Uh, this means grants for job uh, creation. Mm, this is most of the direct financial support. Important role in the uh, ESF support system is played also by financial instruments. In previous financial perspective, we have uh, piloted financial instruments dedicated for social economy, mostly based on preferential loans. State Development Bank, BGK, is a manager of this fund. They uh, choose uh, operators of the of the of the loans and the operators work in five macro regions uh, and distribute the loans uh, we view this pilot as very successful and uh, this lead to increase in funds in current financial perspective to over 32 million euros and uh, this uh, this fund is currently being implemented and we have also great success with it it's very uh, it's very successful many entities are interested in loans because they are very preferential and uh, we have a situation currently in poland that many social economy entities because of the lack of uh, regulation on social economy have uh, faced difficulties on obtaining loans uh, from uh, let's say traditional banks. So the uh, the professional loan systems uh, uh, dedicated to social economy have been very important. The loans are very preferential. Uh, the interest rates are low, uh, lower than than market uh, rates, and the um, the loan is connected to performing of uh, let's say. Uh, additional activities some social enterprises that uh, use the loans create job places 
some uh, uh, organize another actions for, for example, local communities. Uh, since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, we knew that the social economy sector will be affected. Mm, will be affected. The uh, beginning of the COVID, uh, COVID started uh, uh, started affecting uh, uh, social economy since the beginning. There are mostly micro or small businesses, and we have uh, mostly pro-employment character. So uh, these two characteristics um, uh, create a very different, difficult situation for social economy uh, entities. At the beginning of, the, of April, social economy support centers, the network of social economy support centers, mobilized and concluded the study among social enterprises. Uh, the study was the, the in initiative of social economy support, uh, support centers. Uh, at the time, uh, at the beginning of April, 74% of social enterprises were already affected economically by the pandemic. Enterprises shown that more of uh, half of job places functioning in the sector, so more of the half persons who were, uh, who were employed in the sector, were at risk of, of uh, losing their job places and the job places. Uh, stopping to exist so we saw that the uh, uh, that we must act quickly uh, polish government planned wide response for many sectors it was very important for us that social economy is included uh, and we have succeeded with that many state efforts that were open for social economy consist of short-term working schemes uh, to allow firms expecting uh, economic difficulties to cover partly the cost of employment in order to avoid layoffs. And uh, like I said, ESF played an important role in financing um, these uh, short-time working schemes. Uh, social, social economy entities were included in this tool for business uh, and some due to the legal reasons and legal structures in Poland. Uh, had separate mechanism just for them. 50, uh, 540 euros uh, were allocated for that. Most from uh, ESF. Uh, okay, I see the time is up. I will try to wrap this, this up. Um, I would like to uh, also quickly bring two more uh, instruments just uh, aimed at social economy. First is uh, uh, intervention courage scheme we introduced this in esf and allowed social economy support centers to switch their budgets to buy goods or services from social economy entities and donate them to institutions or people most affected by the pandemic or involved in private business there is wide range of uh, service or products as possible meals delivery personal protective equipment disinfection and cleaning services or social services like uh, care services this was very great success uh, uh, social economy entities were uh, eager to to use this tool other uh, other uh, great uh, tool was launch introduces uh, for social uh, economy uh, entities and those loans were um, were liquidity loans uh, that were uh, deferral payment with deferral of payment and part-time write-off when they keep the employment it was more much needed and anticipated tool and uh, i'm sorry but i think the time is up so i will not no more no more take the time Thanks a lot. It was very interesting. And uh, if you want to send a slide, we will, uh, a PowerPoint presentation, we will share it. Uh, of course. For you no to problem. complete. Thank you very much. So we give now the floor to Mia Rossi Gray from uh, DG Employment at the uh, European uh, Commission. Thank Thanks a lot, Mia, for being here because this note has been prepared 
with the support of uh, your directorate in the framework of our uh, successful uh, long-standing cooperation. So the floor is in your uh, Mia to present what are the opportunity of the, offered by the upcoming um, action plan and the other uh, uh, and the new seasoning, uh, the new programming season. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, so my name is Mia Rossi Gray. I work in DG Employment of the European Commission. Um, I work in the unit uh, Job Creation and I work specifically on social enterprise policy. I'm very happy to be here this morning to talk about the um, ESF Plus and the support it's giving to social economy, as well as the um, European Social Economy Action Plan, which is um, expected for next year. Um, so. When I start, I think first, um, before I go into details on ESF+, Plus, I'd like to step back and look a little bit at the broader policy framework and the reasons why um, the EU provides support for those social enterprises. So we can move to the next slide, please. So um, you have all um, certainly heard about the Green Deal, uh, which is one of the priorities of the um, von der Leyen Commission. So the Green Deal uh, is our roadmap for making Europe's economy sustainable. Uh, and this has not changed in the COVID crisis. Uh, the plan is for the EU to be climate neutral by 2050. And the Green Deal is about turning climate and environmental challenge into opportunities and making the transition just and inclusive for all. I would also like to mention the European Pillar of Social Rights, uh, which was proclaimed in November 2017 by the EU institutions and the member states. Uh, the Pillar of Social Rights is about delivering new and more effective rights for EU citizens. It contains 20 key principles in three main areas. Uh, these three areas are uh, equal opportunities and access to the labour market, uh, fair working conditions, and finally, social protection and inclusion. So the pillar is really the compass uh, for social policies in Europe. And it's based on the idea that um, economic and social progress need to go hand in hand. And now if we bring um, both of these uh, uh, together, um, the Green Deal and the pillar, uh, to quote our Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, the um, transition towards a climate neutral Europe must be fit for the digital age and must be just and inclusive. No one should be left behind. And um, uh, it is even more urgent in the context of the COVID crisis that no one is left behind. And this is where social enterprises and social economy at large come in. The social economy still has a lot of untapped uh, potential in the European Union. And um, this is why the Commission plans to put forward an action plan on social economy um, during the second half of 2021. So we can already move on to the next slide, please. Um, the Commission will seek to boost enabling conditions um, for the social economy across Europe at national and local level. And um, it will also seek to enhance uh, social innovation and uh, you can see here the evolution of the EU agenda on social economy. So um, the aim is for the social economy action plan to build on the experience gained from the 2011 social business initiative and uh, the 2016 startup and scale up initiative. And in addition, we will need to factor in the consequences of the COVID-19 outbreak. And here you can see some of the first content pointers already um, regarding the action plan for social economy. The exact content will become clearer um, as we progress towards its adoption, but these are the first elements um, that have been identified. And uh, then I would like to move already to the next slide, please. Um, so we can look at um, how are social economy organizations supported currently under EU funds. The European Social Fund, as has been highlighted in the previous, uh, previous presentations, has played a really important role in the development and financing of regional strategies for the social economy. Um, the ESF is implemented in shared management, uh, which means that uh, these funds are implemented by the member states. And uh, under the current programming period, uh, all the member states in total have programmed 9.6 billion of support for social economy organizations. 
and uh, this support has included grants and uh, financial instruments. Now ESF Plus is the program for the new programming period, uh, which will run a seven-year period from 2021 to 2027, and it will bring together four different EU-level funds, uh, which you can see here. So there's the, the um, ESF element, um, and there's, then there's the Youth Employment Initiative, um, support to the most deprived, the FAIR program, and then there's the uh, employment and social innovation, which is the easy program. And um, uh, up to now, the, there has been some financial instruments included uh, for social enterprises, um, but social enterprise finance also under the easy program, but uh, under the new programming period, this will move under the InvestEU. And um, for the new programming period, uh, the Commission has proposed a budget of 97 billion euros for ESF Plus uh, over those seven years. And uh, the majority of this will be uh, implemented under shared management, uh, which will be our focus today. And uh, we can again move to the um, next slide. So um, ESF Plus is um, the EU instrument for implementing the European pillar of social rights, which I mentioned before. And the ESF um, Plus has 11 specific objectives um, in three main areas. Uh, you can see here under employment, uh, education, training, social inclusion. And um, uh, this here the member states uh, can choose the specific uh, priority areas that they prioritize, prioritize under their programming for the ESF uh, Plus. And uh, here this programming is done um, according to the priorities identified uh, in the European semester process. Uh, then in addition to that, there are some priorities uh, that are horizontal um, and implemented ac across all uh, thematic objectives, such as gender. And um, I'd like to mention that in ESF+, uh, social economy is specifically mentioned under the thematic objective um, that you can see here, access to employment. In this context, uh, social economy is connected to work integration social enterprises um, specifically. However, um, as we know, social economy can play an important role in many other thematic objectives. And uh, really, if we look at these um, different uh, specific objectives, uh, social economy actors can um, play a role uh, in implementing any of these uh, principles. And um, as you probably know, um, the ESF is programmed at national level, but there can be some operational programs also at the regional level. And um, this is currently the case, at least for all the bigger member states. And uh, the programming period, uh, the process of deciding how these funds are spent um, for the coming period is ongoing right now. So this is really the moment for the managing authorities in the member states to take into account social economy actors um, in the ESF programs. Um, and um, just to um, conclude uh, already, um, just as a, a, one of the main messages I want to pass is that uh, we know from our past experience that uh, providing support for social economy um, works best when there is a comprehensive and long-term strategy in place for the um, social economy. And uh, for best results, there should be a policy framework to use the grants to build an ecosystem um, for social economy actors rather than using one-off grants. So the ESF can be used to build the social enterprise network uh, uh, under which you can provide support services, opportunities to col collaborate, maybe training for entrepreneurial skills, and also funding for the intermediaries that can then provide funding for social enterprises. And we have seen some uh, examples today of the um, strategies um, at regional level from various member states. Um, and really, as a final um, message, I'd like to say that uh, this is really the moment of the programming um, for the managing authorities that are preparing the multi-annual programs. This is also the moment for the social economy net networks and actors to reach out to the managing authorities and see how the ESF Plus can be best harnessed to provide strategic support to the social economy. And um, this is a good moment to prepare a social um, economy strategy, think strategically over the next few years about the role that social economy um, can play. There are plenty of opportunities um, available. So thank you very much. I'd like to conclude my presentation there. 
Thank you very much, Mia, for this very clear and useful uh, presentation and for reminding all us some golden rules uh, when uh, dealing with uh, supporting uh, social economy. Thanks a lot. We have now time for just a couple of questions because we are running late. So whoever wants, uh, uh, raise the hand electronically so that we can uh, see you. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Uh, go uh, ahead with yes, your question. Uh, thank you. I know that it's, I mean, it's more of a, of a comment rather than a, than a question. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Emila Hassani talking on behalf of the overseas, uh, the French overseas department delegation uh, from OSS France. So if Sarah is still here, hello. And also, I also know uh, Karen. I just would like to thank the uh, OE. Uh, CD for uh, this webinar, because for us who are oftentimes very uh, far away from our mainlands, it's great to know that there are some opportunities that are uh, happening at the EU level, uh, especially when we have also uh, worked on the regional strategy uh, in Mayotte, for example, uh, which uh, has really helped build a very strong ecosystem. We uh, were able to make a social incubator. Uh, just like Portugal, uh, and uh, creating more than 300 uh, jobs yearly. So it's really great to be able to participate to, uh, to such a, a webinar. So it was just a small comment to, to speak uh, uh, about that, and hopefully uh, we can all participate to all the initiatives uh, and opportunities that are created uh, thanks to these spaces. Thank you. Je la vois pas. Tu peux la... There is apparently a question on ESF uh, on the chat, but I cannot see the question. So can someone help me, Amal? Do you see the question? The special challenge for co-finance project with strict rules, how to deal with appendix risk, for example. So special, sorry, the, the, the question is coming. So I see we have a question from, uh, from Reiner Astor on um, if people have some uh, experience in the special challenges with some of the ESF co-funded projects that have strict rules, in particular when you transition into more distance provision, how to address things like attendance lists and those kinds of issues, if, if any colleagues <laughs> might want to respond to that, because it sounds like a very practical consideration for many today. And a very easy question, of course. Can you hear me? Yes, Rainer, the question has been put, so I think that someone from the European Commission can, uh, can reply. Okay, thanks. Um, I think, uh, yeah, if it's a question on, on ESF, um, it probably falls on DG uh, employment territory. I must uh, confess that I'm not um, an, an expert on this uh, kind of uh, practical question, but I would be very happy to get back to you with an answer um, later on, if that's okay. We can get in touch bilaterally on the attendance it lists. It is perfectly okay, and we will also be happy to know that answer. <laughs> so share it with us, please, as well. So thank you very much. It has been a very interesting, exciting uh, conversation. Uh, I would like to pass the floor now to our Deputy Director, Joachim uh, Oliveira, that will uh, provide some final comments uh, and wrap up uh, our uh, conversation. The floor is yours, Joachim. Thank you very much. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, Antonella. Is this working? Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, I'm so happy that we organized this, uh, this um, webinar and, of course, the, you know, the publication because, indeed, uh, you know, these links between the regional, uh, regional policy and social economy are strong and uh, they are uh, sort of in a reinforcing mode that could be developed in even further. Regional policy is many things. It's a lot of things, regional policy, but there's mainly two things that uh, have to do with the social economy dimensions. 
one first thing that was uh, was uh, was of course uh, explained at the beginning by Amal is the principle of differentiation. We cannot do regional policy if we not we are not able to differentiate policies. If things are uniform, you cannot do regional policy. So this differentiation means this idea of place-based approaches, also the idea of exploiting specific assets, which are really almost you know absolute advantages for a given region, things that exist in one region that don't, don't exist elsewhere. And of course, uh, in this idea of differentiation, the fact that the social economy focuses so much on these uh, local uh, um, linkages and the local approaches, of course, the connection is, is almost straightforward. The second uh, sort of characteristic of, uh, of the regional policy or you know, what we need to do regional policy is coordination. Coordination means complementarities. For example, when you have different, different sectoral ministries doing different things, at the central level, they can have the luxury of doing things on a piecemeal manner, side by side. But when you look at the local level, it's impossible because things interact at the local level and you see it, it's very concrete. So complementarity of policies is something that is intrinsically related to the fact that we are doing regional policy. Other uh, uh, sort of aspects of coordination is, of course, this involvement of stakeholders, so important to elaborate regional policy strategies. Also, ideas like the territorial capital. Uh, what characterizes a, a territory? Because there is a capital out there which is made of connections uh, um, among people, stakeholders, public sector, universities, private sector, civil society. So again, the social economy focusing on cooperation, community objectives, this idea of ecosystem, like was stressed by Carell, was of course it's it's pretty much in line uh, with with these two uh, with these two sort of principles of regional policy. So it's clear it's clear that the synergies between regional policy and social economy are there, and they could be reinforced. So the social economy indeed has these two characteristics that make, make it extremely appealing for someone like me, which is a boring uh, kind of uh, economist, uh, mainstream economist. The first thing is this focus on cooperation rather than competition. Another thing is, uh, is allowing for altruism rather than only self-interest. But still, with cooperation and some altruism, you still can be able to be in the market. And this is, I think it's, it's very important because these two dimensions of human behavior are very important for all of us, but they are not captured in a very good manner by the mainstream economics because we have in the mind this principle of, we call it rationality, of self-interest. So we cannot deal very, very well with cooperation or with the existence of something which is not self-interest. It can be considered as, as uh, altruistic. So this complementarity between the social economy and mainstream economics is an extremely important, I think, axis. The synergy between social economy and regional economy, I think, played a very important role in the management of the crisis. Uh, you know, as Sarah, for example, uh, you know, stated, you know, or, or, uh, or Anna, you know, the role of subnational governments was very important. Uh, cities, for example, they had to deal with the social emergencies. Uh, uh, segments of the population that were not covered precisely by these uniform policies, or even could, didn't know they have access to this uh, social policy support. And of course, the cities used a lot of social economy to target things like uh, migrants or uh, youth population, right? Or people that were in precarious forms of employment, like self-employment. At the, real, at the rural level, also, you know, the social economy was very important because rural areas, uh, they have less a, a access to, to, to well, services. And uh, there are several very interesting examples where the social economy was very useful to help rural areas to develop uh, like alternatives to the uh, sort of public uh, uh, healthcare systems. And, uh, you know, it's interesting that even the social economy helped to actually facilitate this access to the digital economy. We had examples of that. So even in this kind of high tech mode, uh, the social economy was, was useful to address the digital gap, the digital divide that exists between say cities and, and rural areas. Also the, agili uh, the agility of the social economy to address the social distress situations 
uh, it's very important because uh, the social economy is close. It's closer to people. And also, I think important, the social economy in the middle of this emergency of the, of the COVID crisis didn't lose the sight, the track on things like the climate transition, the issue of uh, social inequalities, these things like aging, uh, long-term care. So the social economy, I think, was also very important because, of course, when you have a crisis like that, you know, you have to deal with emergency. So, you know, let's put a bit aside the climate, uh, you know, transition or other kind of sort of situations. No, the social economy kept, in some sense, the, the sense of direction and, and, the, sex of, and, and the sense of, of, of vision. So this is very important. So I think, uh, in, and to sum up, because we have to be very quickly, I think this uh, relationship regional policy, social policy, is becoming more and more a systemic relation, a system. Yeah? Um, and uh, this, uh, this systemic relation, I think it's, uh, it's very important to, uh, to address the problems uh, of uh, our time. And if anything, I think we can expect uh, this, this, uh, this relationship to grow um, over time. And uh, because of that, I think the public sector need to take more and more into account both social economy, but also the regional economy, because actually the regional economy is something that has been also growing uh, over time, needs to be taken into account into the policy packages. So when you have a problem and you design a policy package, these two dimensions should not be uh, you know, forgotten, overlooked, and in particular, the interactions between these two dimensions, okay? So pretty much in the same way the public policies are designed to help market mechanisms, they should be designed to help cooperation mechanisms. I think it, it, seems, it seems so, so obvious. So it's, it's, I think uh, it's important that indeed the social economy is integrated in these policy packages. Why the social enterprises should not be covered by, uh, by this policy support. If we think that in an emergency like the COVID, it's important to give support to companies because indeed this was a completely exogenous shock. Well, the social enterprises are part of this business ecosystem. But I think, you know, in some countries, this, this dimension is not recognized. Although in some countries, as you said, it is recognized. And it's very good that actually the European, the European Union and the European Commission is recognizing more and more uh, this, uh, this dimension. So I think, uh, uh, you know, just to finish, I also believe that the social economy is very important because a very kind of general problem that we have everywhere in the, across the VCD is this problem of trust. We are living in a, in a time where citizens have a certain mistrust in institutions, in particular central governments and even, even supranational sort of uh, institutions. And, and so it's very important to, uh, uh, to have policies, to have, uh, to have institutions that rebuild this trust. And perhaps the social economy is a very interesting way of building trust from the bottom up. Huh? Because precisely you focus, you focus on this community, uh, uh, this community approach. And even if locally you, you are able to increase the level of trust and the level of confidence of people uh, in relation to each other, because you focus on these issues like cooperation, altruism, etc., uh, and and social um, objectives, I think this is a way. If it is multiplied, if it is scaled up, could be a very significant contribution to the rebuilding of the trust of our societies, which show badly wounded in these times. So, I hope it was not too long, but this is what I, I kind of I got as the key messages uh, taking home from this uh, very very interesting morning. Thank you. Thank you, Joachim. It was just perfect. Thank you very much for your very inspira inspirational uh, final uh, thoughts. Uh, I would like to thank you on behalf of the whole OECD team, uh, both our uh, speakers and our participants to have contributed uh, to this uh, discussion. As promised, we will follow up after the webinar, sending all the documents that were mentioned during the, the webinar. And we really would like to continue to engage with you. We look uh, forward receiving maybe ideas, uh, 
best practices uh, that can uh, keep nourish our ongoing reflection on social economy in general and uh, uh, on social economy and regional development. Thank you very much. Have uh, a great uh, day. Goodbye.